Howdy YouTube, picking up part two of the snake cage. Starting by cutting the 45 degree chamfers on the sides and the front so that the miter joints will come together. Normally I would do this on the table saw, but I just don't have enough room on the table saw to deal with the big pieces, especially the front of the cage. And when it's all said and done, the router cuts exactly a 45 degree angle. So it's worth the time and patience to make a couple of passes at it. The very last pass that I made was only a 64th of an inch. Just doing a little dry fit assembly to check these corners. Uh, in theory, I have one more crank on the router table to take another 64th of an inch off of these things. And uh, sure enough, that's what I need to do. Uh, but it's always easier to go back and cut more than to put it back on. When it's all said and done, the joints come together really well and any little gaps look like grain. Uh, well guys, into every project a little oops <laughs> will creep. This is a good one. I was having so much fun cutting the chamfers on the router table that I chamfered front and back of the side panels. That's an oops. I was only supposed to chamfer the front. <laughs> so, uh, fortunately this is fixable. I've cut myself some 45 degree strips here that I'm just going to glue on to the back edges that were supposed to be square to start with. Uh, yeah, that's going to give me an extra seam, but it's at the back and it's on the inside of the case. I really don't think that's going to matter. Certainly not enough to remake these panels. Blue tape makes a better clamp than most people would think. It's got enough holding power to get PVA glue to set correctly. And in this case, it's also keeping that 45 degree angle from sliding. So my pieces stay in good alignment. With the oops behind us, we can move on to the rabbits for the sides that are gonna hold the Lexan windows. They end up being about 5 16 inch deep, but again, it's a couple of passes to get them that way. For the very last shallow pass, I needed good solid downward pressure right next to the bit. So out come the paddles to keep it safe. Since I was already cleaning up a mess from a router with no dust collection, I figured I'd go ahead and put roundovers on most of the exposed surfaces, at least the ones that I have built so far. This is a tiny roundover bit. It's only one eighth of an inch, but it's enough to get rid of the sharp corners. Of course, sometimes we want sharp corners like in these rabbits and the router bit being round doesn't do that for us. So they have to be cleaned out by hand. After using a knife and a steel rule to mark where I want it square, I set everything nice and deep with a chisel and then go to work clearing out the material. It's important to cut cross grain with this. So use the hammer, use the chisel, make sure you have severed the fibers cross grain. You can pare it long grain without fear that it's gonna tear out and make your corner bigger than you intended. With the bulk of the material gone, you can pare out whatever's left. This is a great time to make sure that your chisel is razor sharp because that corner is really hard to sand. On to the back of the cabinet. This is frame and panel construction with the frame being made out of these two inch wide pieces of walnut and the panel being a piece of quarter inch plywood. The assembly of the back frame is exactly the same as the sides, half laps and a rabbit, which is good because the memory card in my camera decided to go out to lunch and take all of that footage with it. So at this point, the frame is assembled and I'm cutting the quarter inch plywood for the back. I pretty much only deal with full sheets of plywood by myself if they're quarter inch. They're light enough to uh, move them wherever you need them and if necessary, bend to get them through the table saw. Now you'll notice I'm back to PVA glue for this application. I don't really need the epoxy for any gap filling and frankly I don't feel like waiting around 24 hours for it to cure. To hold the plywood while the glue dries I'm using staples because I don't have 50 clamps and weights would make the plywood bow. There are lots of options for the background of something like a snake cage but I went with these peel and stick backsplash tiles. They're authentic stone, so they're really rough. They'll give the snake something to rub against to start a shed, and they should look pretty good in the backdrop. You don't absolutely have to rent a wet saw to cut tile unless you want a straight, smooth cut, and then you absolutely have to rent a wet saw. It's a little unfortunate because in the end, I only have to cut four of these things. But then again, it was only 20 bucks for four hours. This mark is pretty critical. I had to make sure I had all those tiles pressed tightly together and that I cut exactly on the line because honestly, you can't go back and take a shaving off of a stone tile the way you can wood. But when it's all said and done, put together, I think it looks pretty good.
Next up is the stock for the front door frames. I've switched to making a lot of my rough cuts in stock with a uh, handsaw because it leaves the sawdust in a nice little pile on the floor instead of all over the shop. I've switched over to miters for the corners on the front doors of this project, and they come off of the table saw pretty good, but they come off of a shooting board perfect, exactly 45 and totally square to the face of the board. Of course, part of the joy of building things yourself is that you can make them what you want. Uh, for instance, the plans that I drew up for this thing called for a one inch reveal around the outside of this frame, outside of these front doors. Uh, it's just not big enough. Now that I've got the stock laying here, that's going to all but completely cover up the cathedral grain in the center divider and uh, frankly just make the doors look way too big. Uh, so we're going to go inch and a half, inch and three quarters, something like that, reveal on the outside of here, uh, which is good because that means I need to make these pieces shorter, much easier than making them longer. Once one piece is the final length, I use it as a template for the rest of them. I cut it rough at the table saw, but then use the shooting board to get it down to exactly the line. Okay, one little pile of curly cues later, and all the long rails are exactly 45, uh, exactly square vertical, and exactly the same length. Lather, rinse, repeat for the short ones. Once all the rails are cut, the inside outfacing edge gets a decorative profile routed on it at the router table. Have I mentioned I love these Jessam guides? Okay, I got these things laid out on the bench. I'm, I'm ready for glue up, but I'm taking one last look to make sure that uh, I got the sides and the tops oriented the way I want. They, they match each other. They match the face frame that they're gonna go against. And I'm also eyeballing the profile that I routed on here because it's next to impossible to go back and route more on the inside of this frame. Certainly anything decorative, you'd have to clean it up with a chisel but I think they're good to go, so uh, on with the PVA. After the glue dries, the doors go back to the router table for a round over on all eight edges. I thought about cutting the same decorative profile that I cut on the inside edge, but I tried it on a test piece, and for lack of a better word, it looked goofy. I use splines to reinforce these mitered corners. Since this is an operational door, they're gonna take a fair amount of abuse. This is not the best spline jig in the world, and in fact, it's riding on not the best fence in the world. The whole thing works out to be sort of like a poor man's wobbled dado, but it gets the job done. The maple splines are cut out of a thicker blank. I jointed the face facing the bandsaw fence between each pass, so I'd have at least one smooth surface on all the splines. I cut four of these strips on the bandsaw and then cut them in half to give me the eight pieces I need for the eight corners. They have a very, very slight taper to them if you look at them cross-section, uh, which means they, they slip in perfectly one direction and they're kind of a bugger the other way. So I'm just marking them all with an arrow before I get glue on them. Now for the briefest of moments, I considered cutting these splines down to less than the width of the slot so that I could plug the actual outside corner with walnut, making it kind of a more interesting detail. And then I remembered this is for a snake, and I didn't do that. It is not strictly speaking necessary to clamp these splines in place. The pressure of the spline, especially with mine being wedged just a little bit, is more than enough for the glue to set up. But this will ensure that the glue squeezes all the way into the corner, uh, and it will also make sure that I have absolutely tight seams the whole way around the spline. Once the glue's dry, even this hard maple cuts easily with any flush trim saw. I don't worry about jamming it up against the frame too hard because I always go back with a hand plane to trim them flush. It does a much better job on the end grain of the spline than sandpaper would. The last frame to be constructed for this project is the top frame of the cage, and it's another mitered construction. So it's exactly the same as the doors. Mill the stock, cut the ends, shoot them square, and use one as a template to cut the rest to length. After the rails are made, they need slots for the expanded aluminum to slide back and forth in. This is actually a pretty tough process. It's hard to hold the material tight against the fence and tight down against the table. I didn't get it in one shot. I had to take a couple of passes to get the thing full depth. I have the top frame clamped up in my shiny new band clamp here on the bench, and I'm fooling around with this expanded aluminum that's going to make the sliding top. What you're going to find when you work with something like this is that there's no such thing as the right sized gap for the track. If it is big enough for the aluminum to slide freely, then it is also big enough for the aluminum to rack and get stuck. And uh, obviously if it's too small, it's not going anywhere. 
The solution to that seems to be sticks. Um, this aluminum wants to sag across a two foot span anyway. It could really use a little, little bracing up, as they say. So I've cut myself some handles that I'm going to uh, epoxy on here or maybe just screw on from the bottom with some washers that will both stiffen the aluminum, uh, obviously give you something to grab to slide it around, but most importantly, will keep the aluminum centered in the track in the frame. It, it will let it slide this way, but not back and forth this way. So uh, it should work pretty smoothly. Okay, well, small change of plans here, YouTube. I realized when I went to put these handles on that expanded aluminum that there's not a prayer of me getting it finished once it's all together. So that's what I'm doing. I am gonna go ahead and finish all the way to final finish all the parts just for the top of the cage. I don't wanna do it to the rest of them because there's just too much chance of them getting dinged around and uh, not you know, needing to be touched up when I'm finished with assembly. Um, but I don't have much choice here, so I'm just gonna have to be careful with these things. But that's gonna throw off the schedule because it's gonna take a couple of days while I let the various coats dry and sand them and do the next coat and all that fun, happy stuff. Um, and I'm not really ready to get into all the details of finishing the whole project at this point. So I'm gonna call that a day or a part or whatever this is. Okay, well you guys know the drill from here. Questions or comments, you leave them down below. Think about hitting that subscribe button while you're in the neighborhood if you haven't done so already. And of course, until part three, stay safe YouTube.